Top five and streaming on CrossroadsToday.com in San Antonio, a deadly shooting claims the life of a four year old and Victoria deputies arrest a man charged with criminal neglect homicide. Plus, Republican hardliners fail to remove Speaker Mike Johnson. What Representative Michael Cloud has to say. Another hot and steamy day over the crossroads. Big storms firing in northeast Texas. They're going to be drifting south. Let's see how close they get to our area. We'll track all that coming up in just a few minutes. AJ Louderback discusses his bid for District 30 representative against Jeff Bachnight. Reporter Adarius McCormick has this story. You're watching 25 News Now at 5. Good afternoon and thanks for being with us. I'm Karina Garcia. We begin in San Antonio where police say five people were shot inside a home, including three children in a suspected targeted attack last night. Two of the victims are adults and the three others are children ages four, seven and eight. Officials confirmed this morning that the four year old died. The other four victims are said to be in critical condition. The shooting occurred when two men got out of a vehicle, ran towards the home and fired 20 to 25 rounds from long range rifles. Deputies do say one of the people shot was possibly exchanging text messages with one of the gunmen leading up to the sh police are still looking for the suspects. Now 25 News Now reporter Adarius McCormick spoke with the candidates in the District 30 race. They stopped by the station just earlier this week and this evening Adarius will highlight AJ Louderback. Adarius. AJ Louderback discussed his experience on the border and emphasized his plans for border security. I mean, my record stands clear, uh, very clear as to exactly what I've been for uh, and exactly what I've advocated for. After 40 years of law experience and living in this area his whole life, Louderback decided to throw his cowboy hat in the race for District 30. His earlier mentioned experience mostly focused on border control. However, his opponent's campaign made claims of Louderback attempting to defund Operation Lone Star. They're just wrong. They're just wrong. This is a ridiculous assertion that I would be a part of any kind of, of, of issue like that. We asked Louderback about the balance of the First Amendment and his views on social issues such as LGBTQ literature. Someone had to sit down and order those books and bring them into the library, which means it's not a First Amendment issue at all. <laughs> uh, it was a choice. It was a choice made. Louderback says his main goal is the public safety of this community, including border and social issues. AJ Louderback faces former Victoria Mayor Jeff Bachnight in this race. We plan to highlight Bachnight on 25 News Now Friday. The Karina, back to you. Adarius, thank you. A suspect from San Antonio was arrested by Victoria County deputies Wednesday. That's 38 year old Gregory James. He is charged with criminal neglect homicide. He is in the Victoria County jail in lieu of a $60,000 bond. In Victoria, police arrested a suspect from El Campo Wednesday. 44 year old Jason Canales faces six charges, including manufacture and delivery of a controlled substance and unlawful carrying of a weapon by a convicted felon. He is in the Victoria County Jail in lieu of a $152,850 bond. In Cuero, police arrested a 41 year old suspect Tuesday. Jess Negrard faces five charges, including manufacture and delivery of a controlled substance, theft of property, and burglary of a vehicle. He remains in the DeWitt County Jail in lieu of a $69,000 bond. Now, recent heavy rainfall across central Texas now has lakes there at full levels. At late Waco two weeks ago, water levels were considered full. Now they are 20 feet over that. City of Waco water officials say their concern now is on the impact on surrounding land and wildlife. On Wednesday, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers gave the go ahead to release water through the Waco Dam. An Army Corps lake manager says all campground reservations through Memorial Day have now been been canceled. And let's go to our meteorologist, Chief Meteorologist Mac Bettis, for more on the weather. Thank you very much. We get uh, too much of this and too much of that. Of course, today we did get the temperatures into the 90s. We are looking at uh, relatively quiet weather, but humid for us. Uh, up north Texas, boy, another night of uh, big thunderstorms rolling through that area. Severe weather just about to move into the I-35 corridor above Waco. And of course, we've got stuff in the hill country. Some of this is going to get very close to our area, so we're going to be tracking it and trying to figure out where it's going to go coming up in just a few minutes. So stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Katarina. Mac, thank you. Commencement at the University of Texas at Austin is this weekend. It comes while the campus community appears to be largely polarized over the school's response to the recent protests there. This is not about miscommunication. This is not about public disclosure. A university divided against itself. As the University of Texas at Austin wraps its semester, the campus appears as polarized as ever. Between the layoffs of as many as five dozen faculty members and an effort to comply with the state's ban on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, and the law enforcement response to the chaotic pro-Palestine protests last month, culminating in the arrests of more than 100 people, university affiliates have been divided on where to stand. It's important to to highlight those that we are protecting those particular groups of students. At this point in time, what we are calling for, what we are paying attention for, is that this particular group of students is being targeted. Over the last two days, the UT Faculty Council has met for special called meetings, almost entirely dedicated to crafting a resolution to criticize the university for its handling of the student protests, several versions of which have failed to pass. We need to be asking ourselves, was the university's response to the recent protests consistent with a completely free and open discussion of ideas? Though the faculty council doesn't have control over official university policies, such a resolution could spell trouble for the university. More than 650 faculty members signed on to a letter expressing no confidence in UT President Jay Hartzell. But a number of prominent people have also backed UT's president. Just yesterday, more than 50 Texas House Republicans signed on to a letter that not only supports Hartzell, but calls on those dissident faculty members, not Hartzell, to resign themselves. And within university leadership, the board of regents of the system System too is backing Hartzell. On Wednesday, UT System Chair Kevin Altaif praised the law enforcement response to the protests, applauding and giving a standing ovation to Texas Department of Public Safety troopers in the room. The university's faculty council is expected to address the issues of the DEI-based layoffs in a meeting later this month that will follow testimony from Texas universities on the DEI ban in a hearing following next week. Missouri Governor Mike Parson signed an appropriations bill funding the deployment of Missouri soldiers and troopers into law on Wednesday after visiting the southern border in Texas. The bill includes $2 million in funding for Missouri's southern border deployment, aiding Texas Governor Greg Abbott's Operation Lone Star. During a press conference, the governor says President Biden and the federal government have failed along fentanyl and other drug criminals even suspected terrorists to flood across the country into past our borders, unquote. I think the important takeaway for folks back home in Missouri is to realize the battle that we're fighting down here at the border is keeping it from happening in our own borders, in our own state, in Missouri. The Missouri governor also says there are good people looking to come to America to achieve their dream, but there is a process to go through and it must be done legally. Now, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene called for the vote to remove Speaker Mike Johnson, but lawmakers quickly rejected it. Greene pressed ahead Wednesday with her effort despite pushback from many Republicans. Greene wants to scold Johnson after the passage of a foreign aid package with funds for Ukraine as it fights Russia. Democrats led by Congressman Hakeem Jeffries said they would vote to table Greene's effort, saving Johnson's job for now. And U.S. Representative District 27 Michael Cloud voted in favor of tabling a motion to vacate Speaker Johnson. In a statement, Congressman Cloud said, quote, while I may disagree with our leadership, I just as strongly believe that a motion to vacate at this moment in time will not serve to help our country, unquote. By a vote of 359 to 43, the House voted to table the motion. Here is your viewer poll this evening. You can scan that QR code on your screen to vote. The question is, which form of communication sways your vote most? Is it through mailers, text messages, or neither? We want to hear your opinion on this. Come to crossroadstoday.com slash vote to take part. And of course, we're going to have an update on 25 News Now at 10. May 14th will mark 21 years since the killing of 19 undocumented migrants at Fleming Prairie Road near U.S. Highway 77. The 19 people died inside the back of a hot packed tractor trailer. A total of 70 people were found inside the truck, which reached 173 degrees. Among those dead were a teen and a five-year-old little boy. 
Every year since the tragedy, family members, friends and the community gather to host the lives lost. Saturday, May 18th at noon, a group will gather at Fleming Prairie Road and U.S. Highway 77. That's the Referio Highway to remember and honor the victims. Now remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Crossroads Today. Hit the like button and click that notification bell. For now, stay with us. In Florida, a U.S. airman killed by a deputy. Straight ahead on 25 News Now 5, deputies say they responded to the wrong apartment. Also ahead, Stormy Daniels returns to the witness stand for more cross-examination, the latest in Donald Trump's hush money trial. family of an active duty senior airman fatally shot by a Florida deputy is calling for transparency. On May 3rd, the 23 year old was in his apartment FaceTiming with a friend who claims hearing someone aggressively knocking on Roger Fortson's door. The Florida Sheriff's Office said a deputy was responding to a disturbance call. The witness says Fortson got his gun and was holding it when deputies burst through the door. They opened fire, fatally hitting Fortson six times based on a witness account during that FaceTime. Lawyers representing Fortson's family say they believe the deputy had gone to the wrong apartment. Authorities say the deputy reacted in self-defense. Stormy Daniels returns to the witness stand for more cross-examination in former President Donald Trump's hush money trial. The adult film star testified Tuesday that she had a sexual encounter with Mr. Trump back in 2006 and agreed to a deal to keep quiet about it during his 2016 campaign. Mr. Trump has denied that there was any such encounter and made no comments today about her testimony. Now, in health news, scoliosis is usually found in children. It affects about 7 million Americans, but it can cause future health problems if left untreated. That's why experts say early detection is critical. It's a curving of the spine that's more than 10 degrees off. I tell people it's not really a disease, it's just a descriptive term. Children's Healthcare of Atlanta says some common signs of scoliosis include uneven shoulders and shoulder blades, unequal distance between arms and body when standing, ribs that are prominent or stick out in one area, prominent muscles in the lower back or a bulge in one side, and uneven skin folds at the waist. A lot of times what we find is that as we get into the warmer seasons and it's so critical right now, all of a sudden parents are seeing their teenager in a bathing suit for the first time in a year and a lot has happened with their bodies. Early detection is critical. If left untreated, scoliosis can lead to chronic back pain, physical deformity, osteoarthritis, heart problems, and lung issues. While there's no cure, there are treatment options, says Dr. Nick Fletcher. If you have a young child who has a lot of growth left, then their risk of the curve getting bigger goes up and you start looking at bracing once the curve gets 
Deep brain stimulation, which involves implementing electro rods in the brain, has been used for two decades for movement disorders like Parkinson's disease. More recently, doctors have also been using it to treat mood disorders like depression and other conditions like OCD. A recent case out of Massachusetts suggests those treatments may be working. The patient's name is Julia Hum, a 24-year-old with severe obsessive compulsive disorder, also known as OCD. In the past, it caused her to hurt herself and even affected her ability to eat and drink. But after treatment using new brain maps and targeted deep brain stimulation, she now hopes to leave the hospital soon and live more independently. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, it was uh, another warm, humid day. Uh, we got up to 91 degrees was our high. Uh, of course, when you factor the heat and the humidity, look at this, 90. But it feels like 103 outside, so you probably felt the 103. Uh, 90 was actually the official high. I believe that's going to get corrected to 91. Uh, but our average is at 85 and we do have a change. In other words, tomorrow may be a little warm, but we're going to be dropping the temperatures as we get into the weekend. And we'll also take a look at all the big stuff happening up in North Texas. All that coming up in just a moment. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure you felt the humidity out there today. You know, you can really tell when you walk outside and your glasses fog up. You know exactly that, that we're dealing with humidity. Well, tonight, uh, while we, uh, of course, are dealing with the hot, humid stuff up north, it's just another day of severe weather. You know, a springtime is usually a volatile time of the year. But this particular springtime, uh, we've now had five days when every day we get more than 100 tornado advisories. In other words, across the whole country, uh, the reports that go out. So, um, you know, it's been really, really very active. Now tonight, uh, the big stuff is up in the, the Dallas area. Let's zoom in on that. You can see how they have a uh, tornado, rather a severe thunderstorm watch here, tornado watch up here. 
big thunderstorm right there coming in right to about the I th well that's Hillsboro right about there so that area and then uh, this next one coming down out of Stephenville very large thunderstorms and of course even farther back down here we've got on Brady and Mason uh, we've got another thunderstorm that one's all of this is headed toward the I-35 corridor once it crosses there, you know, we will go to another level of concern as to see how far down it's going to get. And at this point in time, I think it'll just stay right about there. But you can see how all kinds of watches and warnings up there for that volatile weather. For Deep South Texas, and I'm talking uh, from, you know, probably Alice on down, uh, they are looking at uh, uh, heat advisories for again for tomorrow. Uh, because today was another hot, humid day. Tomorrow is going to be hot and humid, but it's the change. In fact, by the end of tomorrow, we'll start getting a north wind, and then things will get a little bit better as we get closer to the weekend. We also had another day of uh, high levels of pollution. Now, we did not have an ozone action day for us, but as you can see, we had a little bit of a break around our area, and that orange area, or yellow, is um, what we call it, uh, elevated levels for sens sensitive people. In other words, if you have emphysema or some sort of bronchial problems, you may get affected by the stuff. It's called PM 2.5. That's particulate matter 2.5 microns. So it's uh, stuff sort of still hanging in the air that we've got to deal with. So by tomorrow, hopefully this will be gone because the wind will be shifting around. This is, uh, as you can see, today. And that's where we expect all the heavy weather, exactly where it's occurring right about now. Uh, we're not so much invited, but uh, we're pretty close to the southern end of that. And there's I-10 corridor. I always get nervous when it gets that far south. Now, this is tomorrow. We still have a chance out in, in western areas. And why western areas? Well, let me show you in a second. Um, we've got this little system coming through. You see how it crosses 35, gets to I-10 sends a little bow down into our region. I don't think we'll get the rain, but that's when the front comes in and shifts the weather around overnight. And then while that pushes down and gives us a nice north wind for a day or two, and then by the time we get to the weekend, well, that comes back up as a warm front with uh, more cloud cover. That's why I think we may even have some little rain over the weekend. So hot again tomorrow, but the winds will be shifting then in the 80s for the next couple of days. And then, of course, all this changes because of the rain possibility. When does that begin? Well, let me show you. First of all, we're looking tomorrow at mostly cloudy early, partly cloudy in the afternoon, then northeast wind. That's what you got to watch for. And a high temperature of about 88. And then inland uh, in Cuero, we're looking for about an 88 or an 89. Uh, cloudy in the morning, a little cloud in the afternoon, but that north wind coming in late in the day will give us a little bit of a break as we get into Friday and Saturday. So that's uh, the northeast wind and that's Saturday. Sunday, the frontal system backs up. We may have a chance of getting some showers around here on Sunday and Monday, and let's keep our fingers crossed on that one. That is your seven-day forecast reminding everybody we do have a QR code. We'd love for you to scan that. Put Crossroads today on your phone. Here's Karina. Thank you, Matt. Coming up next on 25 News Now 5, we're going to take a look at your stocks. Plus, jobless claims rise to the highest level since August. Those numbers straight ahead.
Taking a look at your stocks, the Dow up 331 points, the S&P 500 up 26 points, and the Nasdaq up 43 points. Oil up 27 cents, closing at $79.26 per barrel. Americans remain gloomy about the housing market. Just 21% say it's a good time to buy a house. Meanwhile, 76% say it's a bad time to buy a house. That's just below last year's record of 78%. These findings reflect the affordability issue in the housing market right now. Young Americans looking to buy a home are facing record high prices and painfully high mortgage rates. Now, the federal government reports first-time applications for jobless benefits rose last week to 231,000. It's the highest level since August, and it's another sign the white-hot labor market is starting to cool off. Thursday's data also showed the number of continuing claims or applications from people who have filed for unemployment for at least one week was nearly 1.8 million. That's an increase of 17,000 from the prior week. And stay with us. We're going to take one last look at your forecast with Mac when we come back. Plus, for all you hairless cat lovers up there, we have some interesting facts next. Plus, here's a look at World News Tonight right after 25 News Now at 5. Tonight, Donald Trump's criminal trial. Stormy Daniels is back on the stand. Plus, the destruction as severe weather tears through even more states. More Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir, the most watched newscast on television. Experience our streaming service, Crossroads Today Plus, stream our daily newscasts, and much more using your connected TV. Just download Crossroads Today Plus on your Roku, Amazon, Fire TV, Apple TV, or Android TV. Just search Crossroads Today Plus. Now, one popular cat breed has a much shorter lifespan than others. The hairless sphinx has a life expectancy of just 6.8 years. Researchers studied nearly 8,000 cats in the UK. They found that the hairless sphinx shorter lifespan is likely due to several diseases. The study also revealed that while domestic cats regularly lived up to 18 years, pure breed cats were more likely to have shorter lifespans. Um, I have a friend who has a not a hairless cat, but a pure breed cat. Mm -hmm. 
and she says, God bless that cat. He's so, he's not all there. You know what I mean? <laughs> but he's a beautiful cat. It's a beautiful cat, but, but he's not all there. Been, <laughs> been breeding too much. Yeah, something along with <laughs> that, this cat. That's what happens. But you know, you want the beauty, but uh, you, you miss something along the way. You miss the, the brains. Anyway, folks, <laughs> uh, we've got another day of warm weather tomorrow. Should get up to about 90 degrees, but by the end of tomorrow, a north wind comes in, and that's going to help uh, sort of change everything. Uh, we'll have a good look at it on Saturday with a high only in the low 80s, but the best part here is that I do believe we'll have a chance of getting some rain around here on Sunday and Monday. That's because the little front that comes in is going to back up as a warm front and give us that uh, rain chance. So we'll watch and wait to see how that evolves. Got to know. All righty. Thank you, Mac. And thank you for being with us. We hope to see you back here tonight for 25 News Now at 6. World News Tonight with David Muir is up next.